to the honourable gentleman who, through the device of a point of order, has put the facts as he understands them on the record. If there are no further points of order, we come now to the main business, backbench business, and to the first of our two debates, that first debate being a general debate on money, creation and society. And I invite the Honourable Gentleman Member for Wickham to move the motion. Mr Steve Baker. Mr Speaker, I beg to move that this House has considered the subject of money, creation and society. The methods of money production in society today are profoundly corrupting in ways which would matter to everyone if they were clearly understood. The essence of this debate uh, is who should be allowed to create money, how and at whose risk. Um, it is no wonder that it has attracted support from across the political spectrum, although I think uh, looking around the chamber the Rochester and Strood by-election has perhaps taken its toll. But uh, I am grateful to um, honourable and right honourable friends from all political parties, including the, the honourable gentleman for Clacton, the honourable lady for Brighton Pavilion, the honourable gentleman for Oldham, West and Royton for their support in securing this debate. One of the most memorable quotes about money and banking is usually attributed to Henry Ford. He said, uh, it's well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Well, let's hope we don't have a revolution, Mr Speaker, because I feel sure we're all Conservatives on this side. Yeah. How's it done? Well, the process is so simple, the mind is repelled. Whenever a bank <coughs> makes a loan, it simultaneously creates a matching deposit in the borrower's bank account, thereby creating new money. Many times I've been told that this is ridiculous, even by one employee who'd previously worked for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation of the United States. The explanation is actually taken from the Bank of England article, Money Creation in the Modern Economy. It seems to me rather hard to dismiss. Today, while the state maintains a monopoly on the creation of notes and coins and central bank reserves, that monopoly has been diluted to give us a hybrid system because private banks can create claims on money, and those claims are precisely equivalent to uh, notes and coins in their economic function. It is a criminal offence to counterfeit banknotes or coins, but a banking licence is formal permission from the government to create equivalent money at interest. Now, there are a wide range of perspectives on whether this is legitimate. The, economist, uh, the Spanish economist Jesus Huerta de Soto explains in his book Money, Bank Credit and Economic Cycles that it is positively a fraud, uh, a fraud which causes the business cycle. Positive Money, a British campaign group, are campaigning for the complete nationalisation of money production. On the other hand, free banking scholars George Selgin, Kevin Dowd, others would argue that what should happen is uh, that uh, perhaps the state might define money in terms of a commodity like gold, but then banking should be conducted under the ordinary commercial law without legal privileges or of any kind. They would allow the issue of claims on money proper, backed by, or, uh, backed by other assets, provided that the issuer bore all of the risk. Now, some want the complete denationalisation of money. <clears throat> Cryptocurrencies are now performing the task of showing us that that is possible. This argument that banks should not be allowed to create money has an honourable history. The 1844 Bank Charter Act was enacted because banks' issue of notes in excess of gold was causing economic chaos, particularly through reckless lending and imprudent speculation. And once again, I'm minded that the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. I will. I'm uh, most grateful, uh, Mr Speaker, and very much welcome the debate that we're having today. He's making a valid point about learning from history. Does it agree with me that it's something we should look very seriously about putting onto the curriculum um, so that young people have a better understanding um, of the history of this issue? Absolutely right. I think it would be a wonderful thing if... Uh, if the history curriculum covered uh, the 1844 Bank Charter Act in particular, it would be a, a delight, I'd be d uh, full of joy. But of course we would need to cover economics too in order for people to really understand it. And since he brings the subject up, I have to say there were ideas at the time of that Act which today are considered idiocy um, uh, and ideas which were rejected then which are now part of the economic mainstream. Sir Robert Peel spent some considerable time just emphasising that the definition of a pound was a specific quantity and quality of gold. The notion that anyone might reject that was considered ridiculous and how times change. 
Um, the, one of the problems with the Bank Charter Act, that was, it, was, it failed to recognise that bank deposits were functionally equivalent to notes, so it didn't succeed in its aims. There was a massive controversy at the time between the so-called currency school and the banking school. It appeared the currency school had won. In fact, in practice, the banks went on to create deposits drawn by cheque, and uh, the ideas of the banking school went forward. But the, the idea that one school or the other uh, won it really ought to be rejected. The truth is we've ended up with something of a mess. Uh, we're in a debt crisis of historic proportions because for far too long profit-maximising banks have been lending money into existence as debt with too few effective restraints on their conduct and all the risks of doing so forced upon the taxpayer by the power of the state. A blend of legal privilege, private interest and political necessity has created over the centuries a system which today lawfully promotes the excesses which capitalism is so frequently condemned for. It is undermining faith in the market economy on which we rely not merely for our prosperity but for our lives. Now, thankfully, the institution of money is a human social institution and it can be changed. It has been changed and I believe it should be changed further. And the timing of today's debate is serendipitous. The Prime Minister has explained that the warning lights are flashing on the dashboard of the world economy. Uh, quantitative easing, it looks like it will be stepped up in Europe and in Japan, just as it's being uh, uh, ramped out in, in America, and of course it's stopped in the UK. But if anything, we're not at the end of a great experiment in monetary policy. We're some, at some midpoint. The experiment will not be over until all of this QE has been unwound, if it ever uh, will be. So turning then to the effects on society... We can't really understand the effect of money production on society without remembering that our society is founded on the division of labour. We have to share the burden of providing for one another. We therefore, of course, must have money as a means of exchange, of final payment of debts, and uh, uh, also as a store of value and unit of account. It's through the price system that money allows us to reckon profit and loss. That guides entrepreneurs and investors to best allocate resources to the needs of society. This is why, of course, every party now in this House accepts the market economy. The question is whether our society, or I believe our society, is vulnerable to false signals through that price system. It's certainly why any flaws in our monetary arrangements feed into the price system and, uh, and become per, per, uh, per, uh, uh, um, permeated through all of our society. In their own ways, uh, Keynes and Mises, two men who, economists who never particularly agreed with one another, were both able to say that currency debasement was the best way to overturn the existing basis of society. Even before QE began, we lived in an era of chronic uh, inflation, monetary inflation, unprecedented in the industrial age. Uh, between uh, 91 and 2009, the money supply increased fourfold. It tripled between 97 and 2010, from £700 billion pounds to £2.2 trillion, pounds, accelerating into the crisis. Now, you just cannot increase the money supply at this rate without profound consequences. They are the consequences which are with us today. But it goes back further than this. The Commons Library and the Office for National Statistics produced a paper giving consumer price in, uh, inflation back to 1750. What we see is a flat line until about the 20th century, when we had some inflation over the wars. But then from 1971, the value of money collapsed. What had happened? The Bretton Woods Agreement had come to an end. The last link to gold had been severed, and that removed one of the most effective restraints on credit expansion. Perhaps in another debate, we might consider why. I, I will. On that. Would the Honourable Gentleman also agree that get, getting off the gold standard actually, and the increased supply of money actually enabled business, enabled enterprise, enabled actually the economy to grow, because rather than being tied to the, to the uh, supply of gold, uh, there were, there were other, uh, other avenues that could be used to grow the economy. Well, raises a very important point and preempts some of my later questions. There's no doubt whatever that, our, the, that the period of our lives has been a, a time of enormous economic, social and political transformation, but so too was the 19th century. And yet, during the 19th century, there was a secular de decline in prices overall. And the truth is, any amount of reasonable amount of money is adequate if prices are allowed to adjust. We all are aware of the phenomenon that computers, cars, more or less anything that it, whose production isn't determined by the state, all of those things, their prices become gently lower as productivity increases. This is the rise, a rise in real 
living standards. We want prices to become lower in real terms compared to wages. That's why we argue about living standards. So this is a will on that. Um, uh, my old friend is making an incredibly important speech. I only wish more people were here to listen to it. Um, does he recognise uh, the, uh, or does he remember, or has he read the book by Nicholas Wapshot on Hayek and Keynes, which goes into this question very carefully? And does he agree that we're now in a new situation in which the uh, unpleasantness of the Weimar Republic and the in inflationary increase at that time led to the uh, troubles with Germany later on, but that we're now in a new cycle which also needs to be addressed along the lines that he's just been putting forward. I'm very grateful to him, Mr Speaker, because I think he does emphasise that the subject at issue today is one which goes to the heart of the survival of a free civilization. It was something which Hayek wrote about, and I think it's absolutely true. If I were allowed props in the, in the chamber, Mr Speaker, I might wave this $100 trillion Zimbabwe note, and you can hold bad politics in your hand. Uh, that is the, the truth of the matter. Um, and people have tried to explain that... Um, People try to explain that hyperinflation has never happened just through technocratic error. They happen in the context of, for example, extremely high debt levels and politicians being unable to constrain them. Well, in what circumstances do we find ourselves today where we're still borrowing broadly triple what Labour was borrowing? We, I, I will give way. I'm very interested to hear what the Honourable Gentleman has had to say, but here we are aware that over the last 30 years that the balance between wages on the one hand and capital on the other has become much more in favour of capital. So would you not agree that uh, the way in which we tax and provide reliefs to capital is key to actually controlling that balance and actually we need to do more about increasing wage levels which actually have been historically going down the way um, in relation to capital over a, a long period of time? Well, I, I think I hear the echoes of a particularly fashionable economist at the moment there. I mean, I would, if what she's saying is she would like rising wage levels, real wage levels, well, of course I agree. Who wouldn't? I want rising real, real wage levels. But something about which I get incredibly frustrated is this word capital. We've, I've heard economists talk about capital when what they mean is money, and typically what they mean when they say money is new bank credit, because 97% of the money supply is bank credit. Well, that's not capital. Capital is the means of production. There's a, a very lengthy conversation to be had on this subject that, if you'll forgive me, I don't want to get into today. But I fear we've started to label as capital money which has been loaned into existence at interest without any real backing. And that might explain why it is that our capital stock has been undermined, that we've de-industrialised, and actually why it is that real wages have dropped. Because in the end, real wages can only rise if productivity increases, and that means an increase in the real stock of capital. Just to return to where I wanted to go, where did all this money that was created as debt go? Well, when I look at the sectoral lending uh, figures, I see that some went into um, commercial property, there were some went into personal loans, credit cards and so on. Actually, the rise in, of lending into real productive businesses, excluding the financial sector, was relatively moderate. But overwhelmingly, where this new debt went was into mortgages and into the financial sector. Now, exchange and the distribution of wealth are part of the same social process. If you buy an apple, then the distribution of apples and money changes. If money is used to buy houses, then we shouldn't ex it, it, it would be at all surprised that if you increase the supply of money into houses, you boost the price of those homes. But, I will give one. Is a, a thing, Member, it's, a, it's a great debate. Uh, but, but when you talk about ordinary people and their labour, because that's money as well, their labour, uh, to them it's like looking for the end of the universe when you're talking about money and capitalism and how it works. To them it's just a matter of... I need money to survive, and um, anything else is at the end of the, uh, the universe. Right, and I welcome the spirit in which he's asked the question. I mean, the vast majority of us live upon our labour, uh, and it's absolutely true of all sides of the House, the vast majority of us live upon our labour. But what do we do? We work in order to exchange, obtain money, in order to obtain the things we need uh, on which to survive. And he's preempted another remark I wanted to make, which is that there's a categorical difference between earning your money through the sweat of your brow and making money by just creating it when you lend, some, lend it to somebody in exchange for a claim on the deeds to their house. It's fundamentally categorically different and it goes to the heart of how capitalism works. I appreciate very little of this is going on in an election leaflet, but I think it nevertheless 
matters very much indeed. Perhaps I'll have to ask my opponent if he's followed the debate. But the point I'm making is this. If a great fountain of new money gushes up into the financial sector, we should not be surprised that we find that the banking system is far wealthier than anybody else. We shouldn't be surprised if financings, housing, uh, London and the South East are far wealthier than anywhere else. Indeed, I remember when QE began, when QE began, house prices started rising in Chiswick and Islington. The point is this, Mr Speaker, that money is not neutral. It redistributes real income from, from uh, later to earlier owners, that is, from the poor to the rich on the whole. Now, this distribution effect is key to understanding the effect of new money on society. I think it's the primary cause of almost all conflicts revolving about the, uh, around the production of money, the relations between uh, creditors and debtors. Oh, well. Uh, it, it, he may be aware that before the last general election, uh, the member for Working and myself and one or two others attacked the Labour Party's position for its lack of growth and were concerned about the level of debt. If you add in all the debts of the network rail and the pension, unfunded pension liabilities and other matters, nuclear decommissioning, etc., the actual debt, which is now reaching extremely high levels, within the government's own stated statements are now up to possibly as much as three and a half to four trillion. Do you agree that that is extremely dangerous? It's extreme, extremely dangerous, Mr Speaker, and it's been repeated around the world. An extremely good book by the uh, economist and, and writer Philip Coggan of The Economist uh, sets out just how dangerous it is. His book is titled uh, Paper Promises, Money Debt and the New World Order. And an economist journalist is seriously suggesting that this huge pile of debt created as money will lead to a wholly new monetary system. I've not even come yet, Mr Speaker, to QE, and I'll try to uh, shorten my remarks, but the point is this. Having li lived through this era where the money supply tripled through new lending, of course the whole system blows up. The real world catches up with this fiction of a monetary policy, and so QE was engaged in. Now, a paper from the Bank of England on the distributional effects of monetary policy explains that uh, people would have been worse off if the, if the bank had not engaged in it. It was, of course, an emergency measure. But one of the things the paper says is that asset purchases by the bank have pushed up the price of equities at least as much as they've pushed up the price of gilts. The bank's Andy Haldane said, we've deliberately, uh, I, I paraphrase, we've deliberately inflated the biggest bond market bubble in history. Yeah. I wonder what the Honourable Gentleman's view is about quantitative easing. How does he see that fitting into the great scheme of things? Yeah, I think it's quantitative easing, as, I, as I'm explaining. Quantitative easing is a, a, a great evil. Um, it's a substitute for proper reform of the banking system. But this is the point. If the greatest bubble has been blown in, uh, in the bond markets and, gilts of, uh, and equities have been pushed up by the, broadly the same amount, then that is a terrible risk to the financial system. I will. Given way. Surely there's a difference in where the quantitative easing goes to. In an, in an economy that's needed, that has a demand deficit and is needing demand stimulated, surely if quantitative easing is going to the pockets of those who are going to spend the money, quantitative easing can actually create some more motion in the economy. But if quantitative easing is going into already deep pockets and making them bigger and larger and deeper, that's a very different thing. And he, he, he again touches on a very interesting issue. Once the bank legitimises the idea of money creation and giving it to people in order to get the economy going, the question then arises, why not give it to other people if you're going to create it and give it away? Well, this going goes, well, what is money? Well, I think money is the basis of a moral existence because we should be in our lives, we should in our lives be exchanging value for value. One of the problems with the current system is we're not exchanging value for value. Something's being created in vast quantities out of nothing and given away. Now, the bank explains that 40% of the assets uh, bought, the assets that have been inflated, are held by 5% of households, 80% by people over 45, which seems then very clear to me, if you'll allow me, seems to me very clear then that QE, a policy of the state to deeply intervene in money, is a deliberate policy of increasing the wealth of people who are older and wealthier. I'll give away. If the Honourable Gentleman, I'm, I'm very grateful indeed that he's, he's allowed me to intervene again. Um, he touched, he, one of the words he used there, uh, morality, I think, uh, or moral, uh, touches really on what the economist Paul Krugman will say, that some on the right see the uh, recession and what have you as a morality play, 
and confuse economics and the models, and sometimes to get things going economically, it's not the straightforward morality money that I think he's, 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 he's touched on there. And that could be one of the reasons that the recovery is taking so long. Conscious, Mr. Speaker, that I've already used perhaps slightly more time than I intended, and I have a little more to say because of these interventions. All of these subjects are easily, as my bookshelves attest, uh, capable of being explained over hundreds of pages. But my bottom line on this is really that I want to live in a society where even the most selfish person is compelled by our institutions to serve the needs of other people. And that institution is called a free market economy. Because in a free market economy, you don't get any bailouts and you don't get to live at somebody else's expense. You have to produce what other people want. One of the things which has gone wrong is the right have ended up defending institutions which are fundamentally statist. I'll give way. I'm, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for giving way, and I congratulate him for bringing this really important yeah, subject yeah. to the attention of, of, of the House. Will he agree with me that this candy floss credit system that the state is presiding over far from actually shoring up free market capitalism, replaces it with a system of crony corporatism that gives capitalism a bad name and undermines the very foundations of capitalism. Well, I, I'm very grateful, Mr Speaker, because I'm delighted to agree with my honourable friend, and he is, despite the fact that I won't be seeing Nigel later. Um, he's, absolutely, he's absolutely right. The, we have ended up pretending that the banking system and the financial system is free market, when the truth is it is the most hideous corporatist mess. What I want is a free market banking system, as I will come on to. Mr Speaker, I wanted to make some remarks about price signals, but I want to really just foreshorten them. I'll try and cover it as briskly as I can. It was the subject of my maiden speech. Interest rates are a price signal like any other. They should be telling markets about people's preferences for goods now compared to goods later. If they're deliberately manipulated, they will tell entrepreneurs the wrong thing. They'll therefore corrupt people's investment decisions. The bond markets, the equity markets, are there to allocate capital. If interest rates are manipulated, if new money is thrown into the system, those prices get detached from the real world values they're supposed to be connected to. What resources are available, what technology is available, what people prefer. But the problem is, these prices which have been detached from reality still continue to guide entrepreneurs and investors. But if they're now guiding entrepreneurs and investors in a direction which takes them away from the real desires of the public, the available resources and the technology, we should not then be surprised if we end up with a later disaster. In short, if after prices have been, up through, been bid up by a, a credit expansion, they're bound to fall when later the real world catches up with it. It's why economies now are suffering this wrecking ball of inflation followed by deflation. And here is the rub. Because throughout most of my life, the way that the monetary policy authorities have responded to these corrections has been to pump more new money. Previously, it's been through ever cheaper credit. Now it's been through QE. This raises the question of where this all goes. Back to the point my honourable friend for, for, for Stone provoked in me, that this might actually be pointing towards an end of this monetary order. Now, that is not necessarily something to be feared, because the monetary order changed several times in the 20th century. Where I want to conclude, Mr Speaker, is we've ended up in really something of a mess. The Governor asked whether the orderliness of the transition, uh, sorry, he was talking about the orderliness of the transition once interest uh, rates normalise. He said it, whether it would be orderly was an open question. I think he's actually demonstrating considerable optimism appropriate to his role. I think it's extremely unlikely that we'll have an orderly transition once interest rates start to normalise. The problem is basically that government wants to spend too much money. It's always been the same throughout history. Governments used to want to fund wars. Now, for all good, moral, decent, humanitarian reasons, we want to fund health, welfare and education, well beyond what the public will pay in taxes. That's meant that we needed easy money to support the borrowing. I'll finish by saying, well, what's to be done? A range of remedies are being proposed. They range from positive money's proposal to completely nationalise the production of money, some want variations on a return to gold, perhaps with free banking, and some want the spontaneous emergence of alternative monies like Bitcoin. I just would point out that Walter Badger is often prayed in aid of the current system. If one reads Lombard Street, he didn't actually support central banking. He thought it was useless to try and propose any change. But what we see today is that with um, alternative currencies like Bitcoin spontaneously emerging, it is now possible through technology then in a generation, we won't all be putting our money in a few big mega banks held as liabilities issued out of nothing. 
Now, I want to propose three things which I think the government can practically do. The first is to continue the present trajectory of reform. After 15 years of studying these matters and now having made it to the Treasury Committee, I'm ever more convinced that there is no way to change the present monetary order until the ideas behind it have been tested to destruction. And I do mean tested to destruction, and it's an extremely serious issue. But it will not change until it becomes apparent that the ideas behind the system are not tenable. Secondly, very much with that in, in mind, we should strongly welcome what Andy Haldane has said, the Chief Economist of the Bank, that they would commission anti-orthodox research. They will put into the public domain research and analysis which has often challenges as support to the prevailing policy orthodoxy on certain key issues, he said. It is that research which will make possible fundamental monetary reform after the next calamity. Thirdly, we should welcome the Chancellor's recent interest in cryptocurrencies and making London a real centre of financial innovation. Imperfect and possibly doomed as it may be, Bitcoin shows us that peer-to-peer, -peer, non-state money is practical and effective. I've used it to buy an accessory for a camera, a perfectly ordinary legal product. It was easier to use than a credit card, and it showed me the price in pounds or any other currency I like. It is becoming possible for people to move away from state money. So what I would like to see is every obstacle to the creation of alternative currencies within the ordinary commercial law removed. We should expand the range of commodities and instruments related to those commodities which are uh, treated like money, like gold, so um, uh, exempt VAT and capital gains tax, uh, and it should be possible to pay tax in those new monies. And we must not fall into the trap that the United States has fallen into of obstructing innovation. It looks like, in the case of the Liberty Dollar and Bernard von Nothaus, that a man may spend the rest of his life in prison simply for the crime, the supposed crime, of creating reliable money. Finally, Mr Speaker, we are in the midst of an unprecedented global experiment in monetary policy and debt. It is likely, as Philip Coggan set out, that this will result in a new global monetary order. Whether it will be for good or ill, I do not know. But as technology and debt advance, I am sure we should be ready for a transformation. Society has suffered too much already under the present monetary orthodoxy. Free enterprise should now be allowed to change it. Yeah. Order. The question is that this House has considered money creation and society. Mr Michael Meacher. Um, I, too, very strongly uh, congratulate the Honourable Member for Wickham uh, on securing this debate, uh, which I think uh, everyone recognises uh, is vitally important and which has not been debated uh, in this House, I believe, uh, for 170 years since the Robert Peel's uh, Bank Charter Act of 1844. And I remember the Honourable Member drawing my attention to that when we were both last speaking in a similar debate. Uh, and that uh, Act prohibited the private banks from printing uh, paper money. And in the light of the uh, financial crash of 2008-9 and the colossal expansion of money supply that underpinned it, uh, no less than an increase of 22-fold in the 30 neoliberal years between 1980 and 2010. I think the issue today is whether that prohibition uh, should be extended now to include electronic money. Uh, it is unfortunate, as um, the Honourable Gentleman referred to, uh, that it is so little understood by the public uh, that money uh, is created uh, every time by the banks that they make loans. Uh, in effect, they have a virtual monopoly, uh, something like 97% uh, over domestic credit creation, and it is the banks, therefore, the banks, which determine how money is allocated across the economy. Uh, and that has led to the vast majority of money being channelled into property markets and into the financial sector. According to Bank of England figures for the decade uh, to 2007, 31% of additional money created by bank lending went towards mortgage lending, 20% towards commercial property and 32% to the financial sector, including mergers and acquisitions and trading and financial markets. 
Those are really extraordinary figures. Well, would you have them get well, yes, of course. Does he, on the basis of what he's just said, does he not think there's an argument for the Bank of England to intervene in that particular situation where you've got unlimited credit from banks? Uh, my my honourable friend um, anticipates really the, uh, the main line of my argument, so if you could be patient, I think I will satisfy him uh, very fully. Uh, it means that only, and this is a crucial point, it means that only 8% went to businesses outside the financial sector with a further 8% uh, funding uh, credit cards and personal loans. Uh, yes, of course. Grave uh, Lord for giving way. I hear what he says about um, money going into building and housing and mortgages. But isn't that because the holders of money reckon they can get a decent return in that sector? Now, they would invest elsewhere if they thought they would get a better return. One of the reasons they probably get a better return in the UK, say, unlike Germany, is there are, not, there are no rent controls here. And as a result of the lack of rent controls, money is more likely to go into property rather than to go into developing industry, which I think would be more likely to happen in Germany. Yes, I, I very much agree with that argument. And again, uh, I can assure him that I'm going to return to this. I think it's better to leave it to that uh, point in my speech. But he's absolutely right. It is, of course, the greater returns that the banks uh, can get uh, from the housing sector, the rental sector. And we have a particular rental sector in this country, different from Germany and other countries, which causes it. But I will come to this. Uh, yet it, it is only this last sixth, the, the two eight percent, lending to businesses and consumer credit, that has a real impact on GDP and economic growth. Only that 16 percent. The conclusion, I think, is unavoidable. We cannot continue with a system where so little of the money created by banks is used for the purposes of economic growth and value creation, and instead, and I'm picking up the point that the Honourable Gentleman made a moment ago, the overwhelming majority of the money created uh, has the effect of inflating property prices and therefore pushing up the cost of living. Now, in a nutshell, the banks have too much power and they have greatly abused it. Firstly, they have been granted enormous privileges since they can create wealth simply by writing an accounting entry on a register and they decide uh, who uses that wealth and for what purpose. And they have used their power of credit creation to hugely favour property and consumption lending over business investment because the returns are higher and more secure and thus the banks maximise their own interests, but not the national interest. Secondly, if they fail to meet their liabilities, they are not penalised. Someone else pays up for them. The first £85,000 of deposits are covered by a guarantee underwritten by the state, and in the event of a major financial crash, they are bailed out by the implicit taxpayer guarantee. Just let me finish, and I'll, of course, give way. Uh, they've been encouraged by this into much more risky, uh, even reckless investment, uh, especially in the case of exotic financial derivatives. I'm, it's beginning to queue up, but just let me finish. Uh, and uh, even to the point where, after the financial crash of 2008-09, the state was obliged to undertake direct bailout costs of nearly £70 billion, plus provide a further uh, near £1 trillion in support for loan guarantees, liquidity schemes and asset protection arrangements. Of course, I give way. I wholly, wholly agree with the, what he's just said. The moral hazard problem here is absolutely enormous and most, one, one of the most fundamental problems. I just would share with him that the British Bankers Association picked me up when I said it was a state-funded deposit insurance scheme. They told me it was industry-funded. I think the issue now is that nobody really believes for a moment that this scheme will actually not be backstopped by the taxpayer. Well, I'm, as always, very grateful for the intervention. Uh, I was going to say my honourable friend, uh, but on this I think he probably is. Now, uh, uh, yes. On the, the question of banks, and particularly in terms of investing in the property market, 
Does my honourable friend think we can learn anything from the United States with Fannie Mae, the collapse of Fannie Mae, for example? Are we in a similar situation? Well, I do. Um, and again, this, this uh, takes me down a different path, but I, I do actually think there's a very, a, a very considerable read across. Yes. I'm very grateful to my um, honourable friend for giving way. He's been absolutely magnificent in diagnosing the problem. But when it comes to the solution, when it comes to passing power away from banks, rather than passing power upward to a, to a, to a regulator or to the state, would he entertain the idea of perhaps empowering the, the consumer, the person who deposits money with the bank? Surely the real failure was the failure of the 1844 Bank Charter Act to give legal ownership of deposits to the person paying money into the bank. The, the, the basis of fractional reserve banking is the legal ownership that the bank has when money is paid in. If we tackle that, power will pass from these big state-subsidised corporations called banks outward to the wider economy. Yes, I mean, I have a great deal of sympathy with um, what the Honourable Gentleman is saying. Um, uh, hold on, just, just let me <laughs> one at a time. Uh, I was going to say a little bit more than I just have sympathy. Um, I, 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 I am going to talk at the end. I mean, half of my speech is really going to be about what I think the alternative should be uh, and why I think the capacity to regulate what is an increasingly, exceedingly complex situation in the financial sector is not a proper way, and I'm going to produce my own solution. But I agree that to the degree to which people can achieve greater control over the money that they themselves have contributed, I would be very strongly in favour of structural changes which bring that about. Diana. I'm grateful to my honourable friend. I was intrigued to hear my honourable friend mention deposit of protection. Yeah. Is my honourable friend saying he's against any form of deposit of protection? So, sorry, so the deposit of protection. The, the protection of deposits is underwritten by, is, is up to £85,000 of those deposits, and it is guaranteed, it is underwritten by the state. So the. the are you against? Oh, no, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I'm not, well, I'm neither for nor against. What I am making, I'm really making the point that this is uh, not something, th this encourages the banks to uh, increase their risk taking because if they're caught out, for each deposit up for £85,000 is guaranteed by the state. All I'm saying is we really need, and here I to totally agree with my, uh, honourable, the Honourable Member for Wickham, that we need much wider structural change. It's not a question of just tweaking one thing here or there, and I'd like to come on to that. Now, given that, I think it raises the question at the heart of this debate. I mean, who should create the money? Uh, and I just ask this question, would Parliament ever have voted to delegate power to create money to those same banks that caused the horrendous financial crisis from which the world is still suffering? I think the answer to that is unambiguously no. So the question then that needs to be put is, how should we achieve the switch from unbridled consumerism uh, to a framework of productive investment capable of generating a successful and sustainable manufacturing uh, and industrial base which can securely underpin UK living standards. Now, the two models uh, which have been hitherto used to operate such a system, one was the centralised direction of finance uh, used, and I have to say extremely successfully, <laughs> um, by several Asian countries, especially the Southeast Asian uh, so-called tiger economies, um, after the Second World War to achieve takeoff. But I'm not suggesting that that method is appropriate for us today. It's not suited to advanced industrial democracies. The other was to bring about, uh, through official guidance, uh, guidance in inverted commas, the rationing of bank credit in accordance with national targets, which, uh, where, and where necessary, through quantitative um, direct controls. This was a policy which did work well for a quarter of a century in the UK in the post-world period until the 1970s, when it was steadily replaced by the purely market system of competition and credit control, uh, based exclusively on interest rates, uh, which has, in our experience of the last 30, 40 years, proved deeply unstable, dysfunctional and profoundly costly. I'll give away a moment. Since then, there have been uh, sporadic attempts 
uh, to create a safer banking system, but these have been deeply flawed. Either regulation uh, under the dictates of the neoliberal ideology has been ever so light touch, and I have to say by New Labour just as much as by the other government, that it has been entirely ineffective. Uh, or the regulation is so detailed. Uh, Basel III, I would remind the House, has more than 400 pages. Uh, and the US Dodd-Franks bill uh, has a staggering 8,000 pages or more that it is impossibly bureaucratic, impossibly bureaucratic, and almost certainly full of loopholes. All the regulation was so cautious, like the Vickers Commission uh, proposal of Chinese walls between the investment and retail uh, arms uh, of a bank, that it, in my view, frankly, really missed the main point. Or whatever route was tried, and this is very significant, it faced the regulatory arbitrage uh, at the hands of the phalanx of lawyers and accountants in the city, earning their ill-gotten bonuses by unpicking or circumventing whatever regulatory safeguards the authorities put in place. I give way to my... Yeah, sorry. I thank the Honourable Member Gilmore. He's always very good on these subjects. Uh, but would I, would I be going too far if I was to suggest that we should nationalise the cities, nationalise the banks, and run up ourselves as a government on behalf of the people? Well... Public ownership of the banks is, uh, I think, a, a significant issue. I am not actually going to uh, <coughs> propose that in my speech. I do actually take the view that it would be a mistake to return RBS and Lloyds to the private sector. Uh, and I think the arguments about Barclays and HSBC need to be made, but I think not in this debate. Uh, I am going to suggest an alternative solution which changes the power of the banks in terms of money creation and puts it in different hands to ensure better results in terms of a national interest. Now, against that background, there are solid grounds, I think, for examining, and this is where I do come to my proposal, uh, the creation of a sovereign monetary system, as recommended by several expert commentators recently. Uh, Martin Wolf. Uh, who, as everyone uh, in this House will know, is an influential chief economics commentator of the FT, uh, wrote an article a few months ago, on the 24th of April, to be precise, entitled, Strip Private Banks of Their Power to Create Money. This is from Martin Wolf, recommending switching from bank-created debt to a nationalised money supply. Also, Lord Adair Turner, who was a former chair of the Financial Services Authority, uh, delivered a speech um, about 18 months ago in February 2013 discussing an alternative uh, to quantitative easing, uh, which he turned overt money finance, uh, which is also known as a form of sovereign money. Now, such a system, and here I will describe its main outline, such a system would restrict the power to create all money to the state via the central bank. Changes to the rules governing how banks operate would still permit them to make loans, but would make it impossible for them to create new money in the process. The central bank would continue to follow the remit uh, set by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, which is currently to deliver price stability, which is defined at the present time uh, as inflation target of 2%. The central bank would be exclusively responsible for creating as much new money as was necessary to support non-inflationary growth. Decisions on money creation would be taken independently of government uh, by a newly formed uh, monetary creation committee or by the existing uh, monetary Policy Committee, either of which would be accountable uh, to the Treasury Select Committee. And I think that uh, accountability to the House is crucial to this whole process. Yes, I give way to my little friend again. Would, um, coming back to the, the original question I asked them earlier on, what role would the Bank of England have in this? Oh, the, the Bank, um, I, I'm coming on to explain, the Bank of England has an absolutely crucial role. If he listens to the, in fact, the last bit of my speech, he will get a full answer to that question. A sovereign money system thus offers, if I may say this, a clear thermostat to balance the economy, which is notoriously lacking at present. In times when the economy uh, is in recession uh, or growth is slow, 
Uh, the Money Creation Committee will be able to increase the rate of money creation uh, to boost aggregate demand. If growth is very high and inflationary pressures are increasing, uh, they, can slow it, they can slow down the rate of money creation. Now, that is a, a, a crucial improvement over the present system, whereby the banks will either produce too much mortgage credit in a boom because of the high profit prospects, which produces a housing bubble and raises house prices, or they produce too little credit in a recession, which exacerbates the lack of demand. Now, as to lending to businesses, which I think is uh, central to this whole debate... Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just want to take you back just a few moments, because you mentioned about accountability to Parliament, and I think he said the Select Committee. I just, wonder whether would, yeah, I just wonder whether would, would that just really just enlarge that a little bit and say, when he says accountable, what powers would Parliament have to ensure that this was followed through in a proper way and with the rules that, that's been, been laid down? Uh, the purpose of uh, accountability uh, to the Treasury Select Committee uh, is to uh, enable Parliament fully to explore the manner in which the uh, Money Creation Committee is, or the Monetary <coughs> Policy Committee is working. And I would anticipate a full three hours uh, discussion uh, with uh, the leading officials of those committees before the Trophy Select Committee, uh, and if necessary, they could be given a hard time. Certainly, uh, these persons who I would see as the most competent uh, persons in this House to deal with the matter uh, would make clear what their priorities were, would make clear where they thought the Money Creation Committee was not giving uh, sufficient attention to the way in which it uh, was operating, and would suggest changes. They wouldn't have the power formally to compel the Money Creation Committee to change, but I think the whole point about uh, select committees, uh, which are televised and discussed within the media, uh, would have a very big effect. But it's a, it's a major change compared to what we have at the present time. It, like all systems, if it is inadequate, uh, it can be modified, changed, uh, and increasingly enforced. Now, as to lending to businesses, which, as I say, I think is... is uh, yes, of course. Um, with respect to the question of Treasury Select Committee, does he see a potential role, perhaps, for some form of joint committee, perhaps with the Public Accounts Committee, insofar as that or the origins of that are to do with taxation and spending? And would he think that perhaps broadening it a bit in that direction might be helpful, so that we got the full benefit of the all-party agreement um, of both committees? Uh, well, I think, I, I think it's a helpful intervention. Um, I wasn't attempting, uh, partly because it's a relatively... Well, I don't think it is a relatively small, it's a relatively big part of what I'm proposing. But it's not for me to suggest exactly what the structure of accountability should be. And I would be strongly in favour of increasing it in the way the Honourable Gentleman has said. Uh, I think until this House is content that it has uh, a proper channel of accountability which is effective in terms of the way our financial system is run. Uh, until that uh, is reached, I think we should uh, bring in further changes uh, to the structure of accountability as may be necessary, such as along the lines he suggested. Now, if I could really get on to this question of uh, lending to businesses, which uh, after the experience we've had uh, in the last decade or more, last half decade, has been very, very unsatisfactory. The central bank under a sovereign monetary system would be empowered to create money for the express purpose of that funding role. The money would be lent to banks with the requirement that the funds are used for productive purposes. Whilst lending for speculative purposes, for example, to purchase pre-existing assets, either financial or property, would not be allowed. The central bank could also create and lend funds to other intermediaries, and the Honourable Gentleman for uh, Wickham referred to this, such as regional or publicly owned business banks, which would ensure that a floor, a floor could be placed. Uh, under the level of uh, lending to businesses, which would be a great relief, I think, to British business today, guaranteeing support for the real economy. And I should add that within the limits imposed, and this is, again, uh, I say this to avoid misunderstanding, 
Uh, within the limits imposed by the central bank on the broad purposes for which money may be lent, lending decisions would be entirely at the discretion of the lending institutions, not of the government or the central bank. Now, I conclude that I believe a sovereign monetary system offers a very considerable advantages over the present system. Uh, it would create a better and safer banking system because banks would have an incentive to take lower levels of risk since there would be no option of a bailout or rescue from taxpayers and thus moral hazard uh, would be reduced. Second, it would increase economic stability uh, because money creation by banks tends to be pro-cyclical, uh, as I've explained, whereas money creation by the central bank would be counter-cyclical. Thirdly, sovereign money crucially supports the real economy when under the current system, 83% of lending does not, at the moment, go into productive investment. I underline that three times. Fourth. Good morning, Frank, if we. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, my old friend has said that uh, the aim of this would be to um, reduce risk and for uh, banks to be more cautious. But on the other hand, if we are to encourage innovation in manufacturing, would this not mean that we would require to have an investment bank at state level so we could actually fund the more riskier um, levels of innovation to ensure that they actually could get to market because they're not at the point where they would be commercially viable? Uh, that's an extremely important point, and again, I strongly support that. Uh, we do need, and I think it's fair to say that the current Secretary of State uh, for BIS has been struggling to introduce a, uh, a, a government-supported uh, business investment bank uh, and has recently announced something along those lines. I think that should be greatly expanded. Uh, the book, which I hope most of us have read by Mariana Mazzucato, uh, shows the degree, uh, which I think is the return of the entrepreneurial state, the degree to which funding uh, for major innovation, not just in this country, uh, but in many other countries which she cites, uh, have been financed uh, through the state, because the private sector was not willing to take on board the degree of risk involved. I, one understands that, but one does need to recognise the role of the state is extremely important, and I would like to see, under a Labour government, something like this being uh, uh, brought in. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend. He's making a, a tremendous case for, for money creation and, and, and what we should be looking at in this House. But I, I wonder if there's also a cultural issue here. Many businesses uh, and many lenders say to me when I speak to them that there's a cultural problem in the United Kingdom for businesses, and particularly entrepreneurial businesses that we've heard about from Honourable Friend uh, in Glasgow, to uh, giving away equity rather than debt, so funding businesses through equity rather than debt, and other countries across Europe who are incredibly successful at giving away equity rather than debt have yes. much more growth in their entrepreneurial economy. Yes. Well, again, I think that's uh, perfectly true, a very important point, and actually I think the proposals I'm making were, would support that. Uh, there is a very different uh, climate in this country, largely brought about uh, by the, uh, the, the, the churning that goes on uh, in the City of London, where profits have to be uh, increased or, or reach a relevant size within a very short period, like three or six months. And most uh, entrepreneurial businesses cannot possibly produce a, a decent profit within that period of time. So the current financial system does not encourage uh, what my honourable friend is wanting, and I think uh, these proposals uh, would make uh, money creation available to the people we really want to support much more fully than at present. Um, the fourth point, and I've only got five in case members are wearying, uh, the fourth point under the current system, house price bubbles transfer wealth, as we all know from the uh, young to the old and from those who can't get on the property ladder uh, to existing house owners, which increases wealth inequality, whilst removing the ability of banks to create money should dampen house price rises and thus reduce the rate of wealth inequality. My fifth and, and last point, which I think is a very important one, sovereign money redresses a major democratic deficit. Under the present system, around just 80 board members across the largest five banks uh, 
make decisions that shape the entire UK economy, even though these individuals have no obligation or mandate to consider the needs of society or the economy as a whole and are not accountable in any way to the public. It is for the maximisation of their own interests and not to those of the national interest. Now, under, a sovereign, uh, under sovereign money, the Money Creation Committee would be highly transparent, we've discussed this already, and accountable uh, to Parliament. So for all of these reasons, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I believe that the examination of the merits uh, of, sovereign, of a sovereign monetary system is now urgently needed, and I would call on the government to set up a commission on money and credit with particular reference to the potential benefits of sovereign money, which offers a way out of the continuing and worsening financial crises that have blighted this country and indeed the whole international economy for decades. Peter Lilly. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, thank you. It's a pleasure, as always, to follow the uh, right honourable gentleman, the member for uh, Oldham, who gave us a characteristically thoughtful and radical speech. I don't necessarily start from the same premises as him, but I, what he says, I think, was an important contribution to this debate. On the securing of which, uh, I want to pay credit to my honourable friend, the member for Wickham. He's done the House a service, he's done the country a service by forcing us to focus on the issue of where money comes from. Uh, and uh, what banks do. And he did so uh, in a very insightful way. Uh, above all, I think he showed that he sees, as our un old universities used to see, economics as a branch of moral sciences. It's not just a, a narrow analytical economic issue, but a moral, a philosophical, ultimately a theological uh, issue, which he uh, illuminated well for the House. Uh, a lot has been made of the ignorance uh, of members of Parliament of uh, how money is created. And I suspect that uh, that ignorance, not just in members of Parliament, but in the intellectual elite in this country, uh, explains a lot of things, not least why we entered the uh, financial crisis with a regulatory system that was so unprepared for a banking crisis. Uh, I suspect it's because people had not reflected on why banks are so different from all other capitalist companies. And they're different in three crucial respects, which is why they need a very different sort of regulatory system from normal companies. First, bankers, not just rogue bankers, but all bankers, even the best, the most honourable and the most honest, do things which would land the rest of us in jail. Near my house in France uh, is a large grain silo. After the harvest, farmers deposit grain in it. The silo gives them a certificate for every tonne of grain that they deposit. Uh, they can withdraw that amount of grain whenever they want by presenting that certificate. If the silo owner issued more certificates than the grain he kept in his silo, he would go to jail. But that is effectively what bankers do. They keep as reserves only a fraction of the money deposited with them, which is why we call the system the fractional reserve banking system. Murray Rothbart, a much neglected uh, Austrian economist in this country, uh, therefore said very flatly, banking is fraud. Fractional reserve banking is fraud. It should be outlawed. Uh, banks should be required to keep 100% reserves against the money they lent out. Now, I actually reject that inclusion, conclusion because I think there is a value in what banks do in transforming short-term savings into long-term investments. And that is socially valuable, and that's the function banks serve. But we need to uh, recognise the second distinctive feature of banks, which arises directly from the fact uh, that they uh, only have a fraction of the reserves against the uh, loans they make. And that is that banks individually 
and collectively are intrinsically unstable. They're unstable because they borrow short and lend long. I've been constantly amazed throughout the financial crisis hearing intelligent people say that the problem with Northern Rock or RBS or HBOS or the German banks or the French, Swiss, uh, Swiss, French, Greek and other banks which ran into problems was the result of them borrowing short and lending long and they shouldn't have been doing it, as if this was a deviation from their normal role. But of course banks borrow short and lend long. That is what banks do. That is what they're there for. If they hadn't done that, they wouldn't be banks. Banking works so long as uh, too many depositors don't with try to withdraw their funds simultaneously. But if depositors, retail or wholesale, withdraw or refuse to renew their short-term deposits, a bank will fail. Now, if normal companies fail, there's no need for the government to intervene. Their assets will be redeployed in a more profitable use or taken over by a better managed company. But if one bank fails, depositors are likely to withdraw deposits from other banks about which there may also be doubts. And a bank facing a run, whether or not initially justified, will be forced to call in loans or sell collateral, causing asset prices to fall thereby undermining the solvency of other banks. So the failure of one bank may lead to the collapse of the whole banking system. The third distinctive feature of banks is that which was highlighted by my uh, honourable friend, that banks create money. The vast majority of money consists of bank deposits. If your bank lends your company uh, uh, £10 million, it does not need to go and borrow that money from a saver it simply creates an extra £10 million by electronically crediting your bank account or the company's bank account with £10 million. It creates £10 million out of thin air. By contrast, when you repay an existing bank loan, that extinguishes money. It disappears into thin air. So the total money supply increases when banks create new loans faster than old loans are being repaid, and that's where growth in the money supply comes from normally. It's the normal situation in a growing economy. Ideally, credit should expand so that the supply of money grows sufficiently rapidly to finance the growth in economic activity. But when a bank or banks collapse, they will call in loans, which will reduce the money supply, which in turn will cause a contraction of activity throughout the economy. So in that respect, banks are totally different from other companies, even companies which also lend things. If a car rental company collapses, it doesn't lead to a reduction in the number of cars available in the economy. Its stock of cars can be sold off to other rental companies or to individuals. Nor does the collapse of one rental company weaken the position of other car rental companies. On the contrary, they then uh, face less competition, which should strengthen their margins. So the collapse of a car rental company has no systemic implications, whereas the collapse of a bank can pull down the whole banking system and plunge the economy into recession. That's why we need a, a special regulatory regime for banks and, above all, a lender of last resort to pump in money if there is a run on the banks or a credit crunch. Yet this was barely discussed when the new regulatory structure uh, of our financial and banking system was set up in 1998. The focus then was on consumer protection issues and systemic stability and the lender of last resort function were scarcely mentioned. That's why the UK was so unprepared when the credit crunch struck in 2007. Nor were these uh, aspects properly considered when the euro was set up. As a result, they established a currency and a banking system without giving the new central bank the powers to act as lender of last resort. It's had to usurp such powers more or less illegally. That's their problem. The analysis, uh, this analysis is not uh, one of those insights which come from hindsight. Uh, some while ago, uh, Michael, now the noble Lord Howard, reminded Parliament, and indeed me, <laughs> I completely forgotten that I was Shadow Chancellor when the bill that became the Bank of England Act 1998, 
98 was introduced. And he pointed out that I then warned the House that, and I quote, with the removal of banking control to the Financial Services Authority, it's difficult to see how the Bank of England remains, as it surely should, responsible for ensuring the liquidity of the banking system and preventing systemic collapse. And so it turned out. And I added, setting up the Financial Services Authority may cause regulators to take their eye off the ball, leaving spivs and crooks to have a field day. And so that turned out too. I could foresee that then because the problem was not deregulation, but the regulatory confusion and proliferation introduced by the former Chancellor, resulting from failure to focus on the inherent stability of the banking system and to provide for it. Now, this failure to focus on the fundamentals was not a peculiarly British thing. The EU made the same mistake in spades when setting up the euro, and at the very apogee of the world financial system, they deluded themselves that instability was a thing of the past. In its Global Financial Stability Report in April 2006, just less than 18 months before the crisis erupted, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund no less, said, and I quote, there's growing recognition that the dispersion of credit risk by banks to a broader and more diverse group of investors, rather than warehousing such risk on their balance sheets, has helped make the banking and overall financial system more resilient. The improved resilience may be seen in fewer bank failures and more consistent credit provision. Consequently, the commercial banks may be less vulnerable today to credit or economic shocks. The supreme irony is that the pinnacle of the world regulatory system believed the very complex derivatives which contributed to the collapse of the financial system would render it uh, immune from such instability. So we need constantly to be aware that banks are unstable, that they're the source of money, that if they are, that instability leads, instability leads to a crash, we lead, it leads to a contraction in the money supply, and uh, that can yeah. exacerbate and intensify a recession. I give way to Madam Dixon. And I thank my honourable friend for giving way, and I'm listening very carefully. Does that mean that the banks are also uncontrollable, as things stand? No, they can be controlled. They should be controlled. Uh, they're controlled both in being required to have assets and ultimately uh, in the measures government should take to ensure that they don't expand lending too rapidly. And that's the point I want to come on to. Because the other thing that a failure to focus on the nature of banking and the nature of money creation uh, the other uh, confusion it's caused is uh, a confusion about the causes of inflation and the role of quantitative easing. Because we don't understand, or too many people don't understand, where money comes from, there is confusion about quantitative easing. And to some extent, uh, the monetarists, of which I am one, are responsible for this confusion. For most of our lifetimes, the basic economic problem has been inflation. There have been great debates about the causes of inflation. Ultimately, those debates were won by the monetarists. They said inflation is caused by uh, too much money, money growing more rapidly than output. And if that happens, inevitably and inexorably, prices will rise. The trouble was, all too often, monetarists uh, use the shorthand phrase, uh, inflation is caused by government printing too much money. In fact, of course, it isn't governments printing the money, it's banks lending money and creating new money at too great a rate uh, for the needs of the economy. Uh, we should have said, Inflation follows when governments allow or encourage banks to create money too rapidly. The inflationary problem wasn't who created the money, but the fact that too much money was created. We're now in a situation where the banks are not lending enough to create enough money to finance the growth and expansion of the economy we need. And that's why the central bank steps in with quantitative easing. And that is often described as 
the bank stepping in and printing money. And those who've been brought up to believe that printing money was what caused inflation think that quantitative easing must, by definition, cause inflation. It only causes inflation if there's too much of it. If you create too much money, uh, I'll give you a second, too much money uh, uh, at a faster rate than the growth of output and therefore drive up prices. But that isn't the situation in which we find ourselves at present. I'll give way to you. He's making a very good explanation of the different circumstances of the money creation. Uh, when it comes to a situation when there is a demand required, and he's spoken about the morality and he's spoken about quantitative easing, what is his view on the theory of helicopter money uh, and where this money then gets spread? Um, well, I'm rather attractive as a disciple of uh, Milton Friedman, the idea of helicopter money. I think it was he who introduced the metaphor. Uh, that uh, it would be just as effective if the money were sprayed by a helicopter as if it were created by banks. Uh, and uh, hopefully, since I live quite near the helicopter route to Basie, <laughs> I will be a principal recipient. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I don't think there is a mechanism available for us to do that, but I'm not averse to it in principle if someone uh, can come up to it. But all, the point I'm making is that either the banks spontaneously or the banks encouraged by the central bank uh, through quantitative easing, must generate enough money to ensure the economy can grow steadily and stably. I give away. Given the given way, it isn't a form of helicopter money. It could be argued that increasing welfare payments, because the people who are most likely to spend money are the people with very little money, and the economic multiplier of putting money in the pockets of those who have little money actually is very positive, as it gets spent and it circulates very quickly. Uh, well. I think there are far better reasons to give money to poor people than the idea that their money will then circulate more rapidly. Actually, there's no evidence for that. I invite the Honourable Member to read Milton Friedman's theory of the consumption function, which showed that that's all nonsense. Uh, but uh, the, the, uh, there, are, there are good reasons for giving money to poor people, namely that they're poor and they need money. Uh, and uh, whether, whether or not the money should be injected by the government spending more than it's raising, uh, rather than the uh, central bank expanding its balance sheet, is a moot point. But all I want to argue today is that we should recognise that uh, the economy is as much threatened by a shortage of money as by an excess of money. For most of our lifetimes, the problem has been an excess of money. Now it's a shortage of money. Uh, and we therefore need to balance in either occasion the rate of growth of money with the rate of growth of output if we are to have stability of prices and stable economic activity. And I congratulate my honourable friend again on bringing to the attention of the House these very important matters. Austin Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I welcome this debate and I congratulate uh, my honourable friends on securing it, because it is time that we debated this issue. We haven't done so for uh, well over 100 years, so uh, it's nice to be able to do so. Uh, this House and the government are obsessed uh, with money uh, and the economy, but we never debate the creation of money uh, or the creation of credit. And we should do, because that's uh, when it comes to our present uh, economic situation and the, the, the way the banks are run and the way the economy is run, uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, it's uh, time to think outside, not the box, outside the banks, uh, and uh, to think about uh, credit creation uh, and money. We have, and I'm speaking, uh, as, uh, I suppose, uh, a renegade social creditor, uh, uh, but uh, still influenced by social credit thinking, uh, not paying total allegiance to Major Douglas, but still influenced uh, by it. Uh, as my honourable friend has pointed out, 93% of credit is created uh, by the banks. Uh, and the characteristic of what's happened to the economy uh, since the 70s is the enormous expansion of this credit. There's a, a graph here uh, from Positive Money, which shows uh, that uh, the money created by the banks was £109 billion in 1980, uh, uh, and thanks to the financial reforms uh, and the huge increase in power of the banks, since then, by 2010, that had risen to 2,200 
and 13 a billion, whereas the total cash created by government, that's the odd 3%, uh, had barely increased uh, uh, at all. So what we've seen is that uh, uh, a huge, more than a doubling since 2000, and, uh, since 2000 uh, of the amount created uh, by the banks. And that's transformed this economy because it's financialised everything, uh, made money uh, far more important, it's created a debt fuelled uh, growth and then a collapse. Uh, it's been run, uh, controlled by the banks who directed the money into property and finance uh, and financial uh, speculation, and only 8% uh, of that uh, uh, lending, that credit creation, has gone on to lending to new businesses. We talk about the march of the makers, so the government talks about the march of the makers, but the makers aren't marching into the banks because the banks are turning them away. Uh, and uh, even uh, commercial property is more important than actual makers. So only 8% of the lending is to new business. This has created a, a very lopsided uh, economy, an economy with a weak industrial base uh, and a, a weak industrial base which can't pay the nation's way in the world because the finance has been directed elsewhere and the investment has been directed elsewhere, uh, and a very unequal society which has showered wealth, as Piketty shows, uh, on those at the top uh, and taken it away from those at the bottom. So uh, it's a very undesirable situation that's been created and it's an economy that's very exposed to risk and to uh, bubble uh, economics. It's an unstable economy that we've built thanks to this financialization process that's gone on since uh, 1979, in which the uh, state controlled, uh, uh, allocates all credit creation to the, the banks uh, and then has to bail out the banks and guarantee the banks uh, uh, that were enormous expenditure creating debt for the, uh, for the public when the bubble bursts and when the banks collapse. Now, some, some argue, uh, I think Major Douglas would have argued, that uh, credit should therefore only be issued by the state to the Bank of England. That's probably a step too far to <laughs> take uh, in a uh, present situation, a present lack of education. Uh, but uh, we can and should create the credit issued by the banks. We can and should split the utility function of the banks, so that's servicing our, our needs and our checkbooks and our pay and so on and so forth, uh, from the speculative uh, role uh, of the uh, banks. The Americans have moved a step further to this with the Volcker rule, which isn't quite strong enough. We tend to rely on this country on Chinese walls, which are not strong at all. Uh, and I think only a total separation of the utility arm of the banks and the speculative arm of the uh, banks uh, will do it because Chinese walls are infinitely penetrable uh, and are regularly penetrated. We can limit uh, the credit creation by the banks by increasing the reserve ratios. Uh, reserve ratios are comparatively low at the moment. The government's been trying to edge them up, but not sufficiently. Uh, or we can limit the credit, their power to create credit to the amount of money deposited. Uh, with the, uh, the, the, the banks as a, a salutary control. We can tax them uh, on the hidden benefit they get from creative credit. That's to say, they get the seniorage uh, uh, on the credit they've created. If it's published, uh, if credit is created by banknotes and cash uh, issued by government, the government gets the profit on that, the seniorage uh, uh, on, on that. The banks just take the seniorage on all the credit they issue and stash it away uh, uh, as a kind of uh, hidden benefit. Well, why not tax it uh, 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 and give the profit from printing money uh, to the, some of the profit to, from printing money to the estate? Uh, Martin Wolf, an uh, interesting article cited by my, uh, my honourable friend, uh, has argued that uh, credit. Uh, centra the, only, the central bank should create new money and it should be regulated by uh, a public credit authority rather like the 
Monetary Policy uh, Committee. I think that would be uh, a, a solution uh, and a possible approach. Why shouldn't we regulate uh, the issue of credit uh, in this kind of fashion? It brings us back to the old argument about uh, monetarism, whether uh, uh, money is uh, credit creation uh, is exogenous or endogenous. And, uh, the monetarists thought it was uh, exogenous, so all you have to do is cut off the supply of money or cut the supply of money uh, into the economy uh, and you bring inflation under control. Well, of course, that was a myth because you can't actually control the supply of money. It's endogenous and the, plant, the, the economy, like a plant, sucks in uh, the money it needs. But that can be regulated uh, by uh, a public credit uh, authority so that the, con the supply matches the needs of the economy rather than being excessive as it has been uh, over the last few years. Uh, so I think uh, that kind of credit authority needs to be created to regulate uh, the flow uh, of, of credit. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I have to point out here, because the whole subject brings me uh, to government's economic policy, where the government tells us it's got a long-term economic plan. Uh, that, of course, is total nonsense. It's only a long-term economic plan. It's slash and burn. Uh, and the only long-term economic planning has been done by the Bank of England, which... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the Honourable Gentleman for giving way and, and to maybe quote Harry S. T T Truman, I think, who said the worst about economists is on the other hand. Now, he said about limiting and, and a committee regulating how much money was to go in to be sucked in by the economy. Uh, who decide this? And the difficulty is, is while the economy might be overheating in a certain part of the economic area, for instance, the southeast of England, it might actually be very cool in areas, and I would think the north of Scotland or whatever. So what might be the geographical effects of a limitation of money into the economic, economic bloodstream if there are certain parts of the plant, to extend his metaphor, that are needing the nutrients and parts of the plant that are getting too much. <laughs> My old friend tried to bring me into... Uh, always ask tricky questions. Uh, uh, this one is uh, perfectly clear-cut. I mean, uh, the credit supply for the peripheral parts and the old industrial parts of this economy, which includes Scotland, but also includes Grimsby, yes, uh, is, has been totally inadequate. Uh, and the banks have been totally reluctant to invest there. I mean, I think uh, I once argued that, uh, uh, like Simon Jenkins uh, is proposing uh, helicopter money, whereby we stimulate the economy by putting money into helicopters and dropping it all over the country uh, so people will spend it. Well, I, I'd agree to that, provided those helicopters hover over Grimsby, <laughs> but I'll have them go to Scotland as well, uh, because I think uh, Scotland certainly deserves its share, as does the North of England, but that's a need to her. I don't want to get involved into a geographical dispute uh, over where credit should be, uh, uh, credit should be created. Uh, I was arguing that the only long-term plan has been uh, that of the Bank of England, which has kept interest rates flat to the floor for, uh, what, six, uh, six years or so, and the economy in that situation is bound to grow, uh, and has supplemented that by uh, uh, what I subject I'm next coming to, uh, quantitative easing. We've created 375 billion, 375 billion uh, of money through quantitative uh, easing. It's been stashed away into the banks, uh, unfortunately, so it's served no great useful purpose. But uh, if that supply of money can be created for the purpose of saving the banks and building up their uh, reserve ratios, it can be used for more important economic purposes and for development of investment and for expansion uh, in this uh, uh, economy. It is printing money. Uh, we've been told for decades, uh, those of us who had a, a glimmering of social credit in, in our uh, economics, uh, that you can't print money, it would be terrible, it would be disastrous for the economy to print money, it leads to inflation. Well, we've printed 375 billion uh, of, uh, of money, it hasn't produced inflation, inflation is falling. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm in mid-diatribe, I don't want to be <laughs> inflation is falling. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, it, it, it has been possible to do that. Now, why can't we do it for more useful purposes than shoring up the, the banks? The Americans have done it. Uh, well over a trillion dollars uh, of uh, 
uh, quantitative easing in the States. The European Bank uh, is now contemplating it. Mr Draghi casts around for desperate solutions to the stagnation that's hit uh, the, the, the Eurozone. And the Japanese, surprisingly, have done it only last week. So uh, if all can do it, if it's been successful here, if it hasn't led to inflation, uh, we should be able to use that for more productive uh, economic, uh, uh, economic purposes. If we create money, quantitative easing, go on and create more money, channel it through a national investment bank uh, into productive investment, uh, into contracts for house building, new town generation, infrastructure, massive infrastructure work, uh, I wouldn't include HS2 in that, but uh, let's say massive infrastructure work, uh, then uh, we can stimulate the economy, stimulate growth and achieve useful purposes which we haven't been able to achieve. This is a, here's a solution uh, to a lot of the problems that's bedeviled the Labour Party. How do we get investment uh, uh, without uh, a private financial initiative and the heavy burden that imposes on the health service, on schools, on all, uh, all kinds of uh, activities? Well, why not through quantitative easing contracts for housing or infrastructure work which have a payoff point uh, and which produce uh, uh, an investment, which produce uh, uh, an asset uh, for, the, uh, for the state. So that's uh, my proposal uh, allocated uh, by the monetary uh, uh, policy, uh, creation policy, uh, sorry, committee. Uh, which I advocated earlier under uh, the article uh, from, uh, from Martin Wolf. That's, uh, I think, uh, the way we should approach it. And I, I, that's why I welcome today's debate, because it has to be the beginning of a debate in which we open our minds to the possibilities of managing credit more effectively for the better building of the strength of the British economy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'll speak very briefly. I, I want to I put on record my um, gratitude, I suppose, to the Honourable Member for Wickham for having initiated this debate and his co-sponsors from various parties. And, and I must say, I'm having heard his speech, or most of his speech, I apologise for being late, um, even more satisfied that when I cast my vote for him to join the Treasury Select Committee, it was the right thing to do, uh, because he's introduced an incredibly important debate, and as has been mentioned already, this is some, an issue that has not been debated for well over a, a century, and I think we wouldn't be having this debate if it wasn't for the fact that we are uh, still in the midst of uh, t tumultuous times. We had the banking crash, we had the corresponding crash in confidence in the banking system and in the wider economy. And now we have a problem of, of, of underlending, partly as a consequence, particularly to small and medium-sized business. So this could not be more important. And the member for, uh, my, my, I'm going to say my honourable friend, because we work on many issues together for Alderman Roynton, uh, uh, pointed out at the beginning of his speech that, that this is an issue that is not well understood by members of the public. Well, and I think he could, was mentioned later on his speech, but if he didn't, I'm going to add that this is an issue which is also not well understood by members of this House, by members of Parliament. Um, and, and I would include myself in that, and I suspect most people here would be humble enough to recognise that this is such a complex issue, this banking wizardry we're discussing today, that very few people really properly understand it. And if, yeah, please. I thank the Honourable Gentleman, and I totally associate his comments about ignorance, and I include myself in that. But it seems to me that the system is really broken. The system is broken because the banks won't lend money, because the government has told them they've got to keep reserves. We don't like quantitative easing, because that means the banks aren't lending, therefore quantitative easing has to be. So there's something very wrong with the system. It is not, you know, if the system isn't broke, don't fix it. The system is broke, and someone's got to fix it. Um, he, he, made, uh, he makes some, uh, a valuable point, and I'm going to be try, I'm going to, in my very brief remarks, I'm going to come to that. But, but the point I was just about to make that if members of parliament don't really understand how money is created, and I really believe that is the majority position, certainly based on discussions. I have been having. How on earth can we be confident that the reforms we brought in over the course of the last few years 
are going to work, are going to prevent repeat, repeat, repeat collapse of the sort which we saw before the last election. And, and my, my view is that we can't be confident, that it's, it's, it's the impulsive position of ignorant members, and again, I'm not intending to be rude to be, I, I include myself in that bracket, but the, the impulse uh, for so many people has been to simply call for more regulation, as if that's going to magic away these problems. But as, as my honourable friend mentioned, there were 8,000 pages of guidance in relation to one aspect of banking that he discussed in his speech. The problem is not lack of regulation, it's the fact that the regulations that exist miss, miss the goal in so many respects. Yeah, and yeah. the problem has become so complex, so convoluted, banking sorry, has become so complex, so convoluted, that we need an entirely different approach. And I would say the majority of people outside of Parliament, when you talk to them about, about, about banking, have a fairly simple view that the bank takes deposits and then lends, and, and that's the way it's always been. And, and of course there is an element of that, but it's so far removed from where we are today that it's only a very tiny element. And most people, or many people at least, understand fractional reserve banking, which might have, yeah, please. I'm very grateful. He mentions this idea of just sort of straight sort of carry through lending. Of course, when people talk about shadow banking, they're usually talking about asset managers who are lending. And in that case, they are passing funds straight through and similarly peer-to-peer -peer lenders. And one of the things that I'm encouraged by is that when people are freely choosing to get involved with lending, they're actually not using this expansionary process. They're lending directly. And whereas the banks have seem to simultaneously fail both savers um, and borrowers, uh, things like peer-to-peer -peer actually are simultaneously serving them both. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 a really, it's a really important point, and I do think there is a move. Unfortunately, it's a fringe move, but you have in the credit unions, for example, something much closer to what original banking, pure banking, traditional banking might have looked like. And even some of the new startups. I, I hesitate to call it a startup because it's appearing on every high street, but banks like Metro Bank have much more conservative policies than, than, than household name banks that we've been talking about today. But I think most people do understand the concept of fractional reserve banking, even if they don't know the term. The, the idea that banks lend more than, than they can back up with their uh, the reserves they hold. Yeah, please. He, he mentioned Metro, and um, Met, the founder of Metro is setting up a bank, which I should declare an interest in, uh, called Atom in the North East. But that is one of over about 20, 22 separate challenger banks, yeah. uh, of which Metro was the first. And, and my point would be that whilst, of course, I missed the opening of the debate, but I don't accept that it is all doom and gloom in banking. The increased competition that is coming forward, does he accept with me, uh, agree with me, is proof in fact that the banking system is changing and the old big banks are being replaced by the greater competition that we also need? I, I, certainly, I certainly agree with the sentiment, and I'm going to come to that in a second. I don't believe it's enough, but yes, I, I'm, I'm excited by the challenges. I think this is, the competition has to be a good thing because it minimises risk. I know my friend on the front bench here, this is an issue that she's dwelt on and, and looked at in great detail. But, but even factional reserve banking is just the start of the story uh, because, as we've heard, and I'm not going to repeat in, in detail, but banks themselves create money. They do so, so by making advances, and with every advance they make a deposit. And this is something which I think is so poorly understood uh, by, by people outside and inside of this house. And it, it, this has conferred extraordinary power on the banks, and, and necessarily and naturally and understandably banks will use that power and have used that power in the interests of banks. But it's created extraordinary risk and the risk unfortunately because of the size of the banks and because of the interconnectedness of the banks the risk is on us which is why I'm so excited by the challenges that my friend my honorable friend has just described but as I said this is fringe this is right on the edge I mean it's an extraordinary thing to uh, think to imagine that at the height of the collapse that for every uh, one pound twenty that the banks held just one pound twenty five for every one hundred pounds they had lent out so it, it, we, we are in a very precarious situation I remember um, uh, when I was very, very much younger and I, I was listening to a discussion and not understanding most of it between my father and, and various people who were asking his advice. So he, was, he, had, he was a man who had a pretty good track record in terms of anticipating turbulence in the world's economy. And he was asked, when is the next crash going to happen? He said, the last person you ask is an economist or a businessman. You need to ask a psychiatrist because so much of it is around confidence. And I think the, the point was proven just a few years ago. So the, the banking system and the wider economy have become extraordinarily unhinged, detached from reality. And, and I think in, in a debate at another time, I'd like to elaborate on, on, on th this extraordinary situation where, where it, it is possible to imagine economic growth even as the last of the world's great e ecosystems, the last of the great forests, 
uh, come down. The, the, the economy is no longer linked to the reality of the natural world, which is the world on which all goods eventually derive. But I think that is probably a debate for another time, and I'm not going to dwell on that. But we did have... Yes, please. I, th I think the Honourable Gentleman make, makes an, a, an point there that we should remind ourselves of, and it was one that was brought, brought to me by a, an Icelandic publisher, uh, Bjorn Jonasson, who pointed out that we're not in a situation where any volcanoes have blown up. We're not in a situation of huge natural disasters, of famine, sort of catastrophe brought on by war. It is, as was alluded to, I think, by a couple of his honourable colleagues, of, of a system failure, and it's a system failure within the rules. And I think it's just worth keeping that in mind. And in some ways, while, it's, while we have much gloom around the banking system, that in itself should give us some hope at the same time. Yeah, he, the, the, the honourable member is right, but, it, but it, there, there are. There are a, a growing number of, of, of commentators and voices out there who are anticipating a much larger crash than, than, than anything we've seen in the last few years. And I, I'm not going to uh, add or detract from the credence of those statements, but it's, it's possible to imagine how that might happen. Certainly ecological collapse, but we're talking about the banking system here, and the two are not, uh, two, two are not entirely separate. But we did have a, a, a wake-up call just a few years ago, just, uh, just before the election. My concern is that we haven't actually woken up, that it seems to me that we haven't introduced any significant meaningful reforms which go to the heart of the problems we're discussing today. It seems to me that we've been tinkering on the edges, and I don't believe Parliament has been as closely involved in that process as Parliament should be, partly because of the ignorance that I described at the beginning of my, of my remarks. So I, I, I just want to put on the record my support for a meaningful uh, a monetary commission of some sort to be established, or an equivalent of, where we are able to actually examine the pros and cons of shifting from a factional to something closer to a full reserve banking system, as a number of members have discussed today. This is something we need to understand. What are the pros and cons of such a move? How possible is that? Who wins? Who loses? I don't think many people really fully understand the answers. And I think we need to look at quantitative easing. It's been accepted, I think, by everyone on, on all sides of the House that quantitative easing is not objective. There are, there are those who believe it's a good and those who believe it's a bad, but no one believes it's objective. And if there is a majority view that quantitative easing, e easing is necessary, then we need to ask the question, why not use those funds, inject those funds into the real economy, into housing, into energy projects, and so on, of the kind of projects we've heard from the other side, as opposed to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, using the mechanism in such a way that clearly only benefits very few people within the financial banking wizardry uh, world that we're discussing today. So I think these issues need to be explored, and I think it is time for a monetary commission to be established, and for Parliament then to become much more engaged than we have been. This is a very small step in that direction. I'm very grateful to the sponsors of today's debate. I wish there were more people here today. I was intending to listen, not speak, uh, but there aren't all that many speakers, unfortunately, but it is the beginning, and I hope we'll have many more such debates. Thank you. Are you standing, Mr. Durkin? Are you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just your Mark Durkin. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy uh, Speaker. Uh, I raise uh, briefly to endorse what I think have been very significant points made by a number of honourable uh, members. In particular, uh, I want to uh, pay tribute for the honourable member for Wickham uh, for having uh, secured the debate and opened, the, opened it uh, so strongly. And I know uh, from watching the honourable member on uh, previous uh, bill committees when we were dealing exactly with some of these issues in and around banking reform and other uh, questions, that uh, he was someone who uh, was dubious about some of the almost uh, feng shui-like arguments we were having about the regulatory furniture uh, in circumstances where there were fundamental questions to be asked about the very foundations uh, on which things uh, sat, and I think he amplified that in his contribution uh, today. The uh, Honourable Member uh, for Oldham West had made the point that uh, the whole approach to uh, quantitative easing, which many members have, uh, have, have, have questioned at a number of levels, uh, but one thing that it does prove that is that in many ways the underlying logic of the concept of sovereign money creation uh, is actually uh, feasible and uh, workable. Uh, so those who dispute that, it is strange that some of those who uh, would dispute and refute uh, the case that is made around sovereign uh, money creation, sometimes there are people who then defend uh, quantitative easing uh, in the form and with the features that it uh, has actually had. And in many ways what quantitative easing uh, has uh, shown is that if we are going to use the facility 
uh, of uh, the state and the state's main tool in this situation obviously is uh, the Bank of England uh, to uh, alter the money supply to uh, prime uh, the money supply in a particular way, then we could have chosen a much better uh, way of doing it than the form that was chosen uh, by quantitative uh, easing. Because, in a sense, while it is meant to have achieved uh, increases uh, in the money supply, where have people felt that in terms of business credit? Where have people felt that uh, in terms of wages, in terms uh, of consumer power and the stimulus that that uh, is able to provide? And so we basically look back on the financial crash and its aftermath. And we see evidence, and it's not just in the UK, it's in Ireland and it's in other places uh, as well, uh, where a lot of what we were being told up until the crash was the worth and the wealth of particular sectors in the economy has turned out to be uh, vacuous, but the poverty that lays in its trail uh, is actually vicious. Uh, so the wealth and the worth hasn't been real, uh, but the poverty is. And so people then rightly uh, question. People like Positive Money UK or Sensible Money uh, in Ireland uh, are saying, well, maybe uh, how we treat the creation uh, of money and how uh, politics and those of us who are charged with meant to be overseeing public policy as it affects uh, the economy uh, need to have a more basic look uh, at how we are treating uh, the banking system and the very nature of money creation uh, itself. Obviously, as someone from uh, Northern Ireland, uh, we grew up very used to the idea of bank notes, <laughs> and so we're used to the idea of the banks themselves issuing uh, their own money. But we don't think very much uh, about that. We think, well, that's all happening against uh, the Bank of England and, uh, and, under, and under the Bank of England's uh, licence. But as someone who sat on the Financial Services Bill uh, Committee and also on the Banking Services uh, on the Banking Reform uh, Financial Services Bill. Uh, committee. Uh, it seems to me that while there has been a recognition that some more by way of regulation needed to go back to uh, the Bank uh, of England, there still seems to be a very uh, cluttered arrangement around regulation and around the role of the Bank of England. In fact, I think there is maybe a risk that in trying to correct the regulatory deficiencies that went before uh, the crash, we have maybe uh, created uh, too many conflicting and potentially confusing roles for the Bank of England themselves. And in terms of the various uh, committees and the personages and the different roles and job descriptions that attach to some of the people who will be appointed to those committees, uh, it seems to me that there is a potential uh, clutter uh, in the role of the Treasury, because the common denominator, the common reference point in all of this. Uh, in terms of these range of different committees and bodies and the different things uh, that they will do, is uh, the Treasury. And there was not enough uh, in those bills and the arrangements that were made uh, to make sure that what the Treasury uh, would be doing and how the Treasury would be exercising its powers and influencing the judgments and informing the criteria and the considerations uh, of those different uh, committees under the Bank of England, uh, that little of it had, was having enough uh, scrutiny or back play through uh, Parliament. And so, again, I would endorse the points that have been made by other honourable members about ensuring more accountability, whether it be through uh, more formal reference to the Treasury Select Committee or whether it be some other hybrid, as has been suggested in an earlier intervention on the honourable member uh, for Oldham. But certainly, there should be more uh, parliamentary uh, insight and definitely parliamentary oversight. Uh, in relation to these matters, so that we can't all say that we're suddenly shocked that all the confidence that was stated in various regulatory systems turned out to have been badly placed. That was our experience the last time when people who are now criticising the previous government for not having had enough regulation were actually saying there was too much regulation and were calling for more deregulation uh, at that time. If we in this parliament have produced a new regulatory uh, order, we need to be prepared uh, to face and follow through the questions that. Uh, arise and leaving arrangements in place that mean that this only comes back in part to Parliament the next time there is a crisis and we then have to re-legislate, I think is not uh, good enough. We should be doing more uh, to be on our watch, and that is one of the reasons why I thank the Honourable Member uh, for Wickham and the others uh, who have brought about uh, this debate are doing us a service in that regard. It is time to say we want more of a parliamentary watch window uh, on uh, these uh, issues. It's, 
Uh, important, Madam Deputy uh, Speaker, uh, I think in this situation to uh, recognise as, as well that uh, if we are going to be talking about uh, the creation of, of, of money uh, and quantitative easing, we are recognising that there is uh, a role, a necessary role uh, for banks, uh, but we need to be sure that we are entrusting them with the right role and that it is in the context of the appropriate uh, controls and uh, disciplines. And I think that is what is uh, fundamental to this. The idea that we just leave it uh, to the whims of the banks uh, and uh, their lending, uh, reinforced supposedly and stimulated by quantitative uh, easing, uh, to profile uh, the performance of the uh, economy, I do not think is good enough or is uh, strong enough. We also have the question in relation to quantitative easing that if it works uh, on the basis of the Bank of uh, uh, England through uh, the asset purchase uh, facility uh, essentially uh, using uh, money that it creates under quantitative uh, easing uh, to buy gilts from a pension uh, fund whose bank account is with the RBS, which in essence is then owned by uh, the uh, Bank of, 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 of England in, in circumstance, we get into a situation where okay, RBS's bank account with the Bank of England then goes up by the value of that uh, gilt uh, purchase. Simultaneously, the bank account of the pension fund uh, goes up by the amount of that uh, gilt purchase, and we are told that the UK money supply has uh, increased. But what happens in that situation, yes, in theory, the pension fund can now go and purchase other assets. Is that what is uh, happening? But people are left with a sense that we can see how 1% of the mo- 1% in terms of the big money holders and, and money players uh, appear to have been advantaged uh, and in uh, quantitative easing. But where's the trickle down uh, to all the rest of the uh, economy? It uh, actually isn't uh, there. And again, that brings me back to the point in terms of the uh, sovereign money creation uh, model, which seems which seems to me to be. Uh, primed much more specifically with a view of the total economy and providing a broad and stable uh, and more bal- balanced approach uh, to stimulus and to economic performance uh, there. We have had the slowest recovery coming out uh, of a recession uh, in the circumstance of quantitative easing. And I do not say that to try you know, to get some voice activated reaction from people on the government benches to say about how good the recovery is and the performance or whatever. But the fact is, uh, w- when we look at it in, in broader historic terms, uh, it is the slowest recovery, and, and that leaves us questions about quantitative easing as well. We also heard from the Prime Minister, of course, about the red warning lights uh, on the dashboard of the world economy, and I wonder uh, if the Prime Minister would er- ever tell us that, you know, and to his mind, those warning lights include the degree to which uh, global banks are now back playing heavily in uh, derivatives uh, again, uh, and whether that's among uh, those sorts, uh, whether that's among the warning lights uh, that say that there needs to be uh, more action, and of course that raises issue not just about regulation uh, at the national level, but also concerted uh, regulation at the uh, international level as well. Catherine McKim. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I wanted to start very much by congratulating the Honourable Member for uh, Wickham on his uh, very thoughtful and thorough opening speech, um, but also the Honourable Member uh, for Oldham, Western Brighton, my Honourable Friend, um, at, uh, for, for his uh, speech from this side of the House also, um, but also uh, now in their absence, um, the Honourable Member for Brighton Pavilion and Clacton for securing today's uh, very important debate. Um, It has been um, uh, this. I mean, this debate obviously comes following a significant campaign by Positive Money, who have been raising some extremely important issues about how we ensure financial stability, or how we, as parliamentarians, and indeed how members of the public, can gain a far greater understanding of the way in which our economy works, and in particular how money is supplied, not just in this country but around the world as well. Uh, We have seen from today's debate that uh, some very important questions have been highlighted and I think not all have been answered uh, in this debate. Questions about how our money is created, how that money or credit is used by banks and others, how our financial system can be more transparent and accountable. 
particularly how it can actually benefit the country as a whole. And it's on that latter point in particular that um, I know particularly this side of the House have been uh, acutely focused on how we rework our economy, whether it's in the field of banking, whether it's in relation to jobs, whether it's in relation to wages, so that it does actually work for the country as a whole. Um, I think, though, um, it'd be worth reflecting just for a moment on uh, the system that we currently have in this country and what it means for money creation. Because, as the Honourable Member for Wickham set out very eloquently in his opening speech, we know that currency is created in the conventional sense of being printed by the Bank of England, but commercial banks can create money by ways of account holders depositing money into their accounts or by issuing loans to borrowers, which obviously increases the amount of money that's available to borrowers and within the wider economy. And as the Bank of England made clear in an article accompanying their first quarterly bulletin in 2014 this year, when a bank makes a loan to one of its customers, it simply credits the customer's account with a higher deposit balance. At that instant, new money is created. So bank loans and deposits are essentially IOUs from the banks and therefore a form of money creation. However, we know that commercial banks do not have unlimited abilities to create money. Monetary policy, financial stability and regulation all influence the amount of money that commercial banks can create. In that sense, they are um, regulated by the Prudential Regulation Authority, part of the Bank of England, and the Financial Conduct Authority. And these regulators, um, some of which are quite rightly independent, are the stewards of safety and soundness in financial institutions, especially regarding banks' money-creating practices. Um, so banks are compelled to manage the liabilities on their bank balance sheets to ensure that they have capital and longer-term liabilities precisely to mitigate the risks to pre prevent them ha having effectively a licence to print money. So um, we know that banks have to adhere to the leverage ratio the limit uh, to, on the bank's balance sheets compared with the actual equity or capital that they hold. And that is something that we obviously uh, very much support because limiting a bank's balance sheet does limit the amount of money that they can create through uh, their lending or deposits. And that there are a series of checks and balances in place when it comes to creating money, some of which the opposition have strongly supported when we have debated um, on the legislative changes that have taken place in recent years. And it remains our view that the central issue here, the instability of money supply within the banking system, is less to do with the powers that the banks hold and the way in which they create money effectively, but more to do with the way the banks conduct themselves and whether they actually act in the public interest in, the way, in, in other ways as well. So we believe that the issues here or about the incentives that are in place for banks to ensure that loans and debts are repaid, that they're only granted when there is a strong likelihood of repayment, when the money supply increases rapidly with no uh, certainty of repayment, then that is when real risks emerge in the economy. And these were the issues that were debated at great length during the Financial Services Banking Reform Act when it made its way through Parliament in 2013. It followed recommendations from the Sir John Vickers Independent Commission of Banking, as well as the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards, which looked at professional standards and culture in the industry. That Act created the uh, Prudential Regulation Authority um, and gives the regulators the power to split up banks to safeguard their future, um, to name just uh, an example, two examples of changes that were made, but we feel it did not go far enough because the concern is that the government's actions to date uh, in this particular area have fallen short of the mark and it has failed to boost sufficient competition in the banking industry to raise those standards and to create that public confidence uh, in the sector. Um, and as honourable members, I'm sure, who have an interest in this area know that we, the opposition, tabled a number of amendments to try and strengthen the bill, including preventing banks from overreaching themselves and taking greater risks to in, uh, by ensuring that the leverage ratio is effective. And that really goes to the heart of a lot of the issues that are being debated today. Uh, the government rejected our proposals to impose a duty of care to customers on all those working in the banking industry 
which would help reform banking so that it does interest, uh, work in the interests of customers and the economy and not solely in the interests of the banks themselves. Um, these are areas that we still feel uh, we need to see reform in the sector. Um, and it is clear from this debate that there are a whole range of issues to consider. But our focus at the moment is that the banks need to be tightly, correctly regulated to ensure that they work for the whole economy, including individuals and small and large businesses. It's a key issue that we face at present, and it's only when the banks that op operate in this way that, and they work in the interests of the whole economy that, the, that we will actually find our way out of this cost of living crisis that we know many people are facing. So I thank again honourable members for bringing this very important debate in front of the House as well as all the interesting contributions and interventions that have been made uh, by honourable members from right across the, uh, the House. I'm pretty certain from the discussion today that this is uh, not the end of this conversation and that the, 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 the debate very much will go on. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and uh, I would like to also add my congratulations. This has been a really fascinating debate and one that is very long overdue, and that is to actually consider not just what more we can do to improve what we have, but whether, in fact, we should be throwing it away and starting again. And I do genuinely welcome the debate, and I do hope that there will be many more to follow. And in particular, I'd like to pay tribute to my honourable friend, the Member for Wickham, who is now on the Treasury Select Committee, which I had the a great honour to serve on for four years and I'm quite sure that his views, his challenge to the orthodoxy will have been extremely welcomed um, and, uh, by them and by many others. So good luck to him with, with that. I'm very happy to give away. On that point, can I just say how, how much I'm enjoying her place on the committee and I do congratulate her on her promotion once again. <laughs> I am grateful to him for that. I would also particularly like to point out to my honourable friend, the member for Hitchin and Harpenden, who I think gave a fantastic explanation, which I would commend to anybody who wants to understand how money is created, to look at as a very good teaching. Perhaps he could consider going to deliver that under financial education curriculum in school, uh, because it really, it really was very enlightening, and not least of which, because um, it, it highlighted actually the appalling failure of regulation in the run-up to the financial crisis, which I think um, has uh, really is still reverberating in our economy today. And I think um, all honourable members have made some very interesting points about um, what we can do better and whether we should be thinking again. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the honourable member for Oldham for his uh, good explanation of the positive money agenda, which is certainly an, an idea worthy of thought, and I will come on to that. So um, I want to start by saying money creation is a very important and complex aspect of our economy that I do agree with members is very often misunderstood. So I'd like to very quickly set out how the system works at present. The money held by households and companies takes two forms, currency, which is banknotes and coins, and bank deposits. The vast majority, as my honourable friend for Wickham pointed out, is in the form of bank deposits. And my honourable friend is right to say that bank deposits are primarily created by commercial banks themselves each time they make a loan. Whenever a bank makes a loan, it credits the borrower's bank account with a new deposit, and that creates new money. However, there are limits to how much new money is created at any point in time. When a bank makes a loan, it obviously does so under the expectation that this loan will be repaid in the future. Households repay their mortgages out of their salaries. Businesses repay their loans out of income from their investments. In other, in other words, banks will not create new money unless they think at the time that new value will also in due course be created, enabling that loan to be paid back. So ultimately, money creation depends on the policies of the Bank of England. Changes to the bank rate affect market interest rates and in turn the saving and borrowing decisions of households and businesses. And the idea is that prudential regulation is used if excessive risk-taking or asset price bubbles are creating excessive lending. So these checks and balances, Madam Deputy Speaker, are an integral part of the system. 
So I fully agree that the regulatory system was totally unfit in the run-up to the financial crisis. We saw risky behaviour, excessive lending, a general lack of restraint on all sides, and of course the key problem was that the buck didn't stop anywhere. And so what we had was uh, when finally there were problems in the banking system, regulators looking at each other for who was responsible. And we all know that the outcome of that was the financial crisis of 2008. And I too see the financial crisis as a prime example of why we need not just change, but also a better banking culture. A culture where people don't spend their time thinking about how to get round the rules. A culture where there isn't a tension between what's good for the firm and what's good for the customer. And a culture where infringements of the rules are very properly and very seriously dealt with. And in a few minutes I'll touch on some of the things we're doing to change the regulations and change the culture. But first, I just want to briefly set out why we don't believe that the right solution is the wholesale replacement of the current system by something else, such as a sovereign monetary system. Under a sovereign monetary system, it would be the state, not banks, creating new money. The central bank, via a committee, would decide how much money is created, and this money would mostly be transferred to the government. Lending would come from the pool of customers' investment account deposits held by commercial banks. Such a system would raise a number of very important <coughs> questions. How would that committee assess how much money should be created to meet the inflation target and support the economy? If the central bank had the power to finance government's policies, what would the implications be for the credibility of the fiscal framework and the government's ability to borrow from the market if it needed to? What would be the impact on the availability of credit for businesses and households? Wouldn't credit become very pro-cyclical? Wouldn't we incentivise financing households over businesses? Because in the case of businesses, banks would presumably expect the state to step in. Wouldn't we be encouraging the emergence of an unregulated set of new shadow banks? And wouldn't the introduction of a totally new system, untested across modern advanced economies, create unnecessary risk at a time when what people need is stability? I will give way. I'll just make a couple of points. I don't actually support positive money's proposals, as they know, although I'm glad to work with them because I support their diagnosis of the problem. But in 1844, <laughs> of course, they could have advanced this argument, and they didn't. Uh, but the, the, the final point, really, is to say that I, of course, haven't proposed throwing away the system and doing something radically new. I've proposed getting rid of all of the obstacles to the free market creating alternative currencies. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for pointing that out, and I, I must confess, before this debate, I was rather puzzled by the fact that such an intelligent and extremely sensible person as he should be making the case for what I would see in a sovereign monetary system, for an extraordinarily state interventionist um, new proposal. So I'm very glad to hear that that's not uh, what he's proposing. And of course, bearing in mind our current set of regulators, we would presumably then be looking at a committee of middle-aged white men making the decision on what the economy needs and that also would be a significant concern to me were that to happen so my own position which I I will of course give way to my, uh, before, th man. before the minister um, leaves the whole question of um, sovereign monetary system which obviously she's totally opposed to and raised several objections which I cannot in an intervention answer uh, but does she not believe at the present time that the system of bank uh, money creation uh, is highly pro-cyclical and has enormously benefited uh, property and financial sectors to the disadvantage of the vast range of industry outside the financial sector? As I, as I said at the beginning, I sincerely congratulate the Honourable Member for raising this issue. It is certainly one that's worthy of discussion. I look forward to him um, coming back on some of the arguments that I've raised. But very specifically, yes, I also agree with him that where we were in the run-up to the financial crisis was entirely inappropriate. And I will come on to some of the steps that we've taken to improve, not throw away the baby with the bathwater, but to improve what we have now rather than throw it away and start again. So I know that... Um, 
In addition, some of my honourable friends and, and members opposite have a particular concern about quantitative easing, as I'm on the record of, uh, as having made clear that I do too, and specifically how you might unwind it. But they should surely agree that at least quantitative easing can be unwound, unlike the proposal of helicopter money, which seems to me to be a giant step beyond quantitative easing, a step where money would be created by the state with no obvious way then to rein it back if necessary. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, if the tap in my bathroom breaks, rather than wrenching the sink off the wall, I would prefer to fix the tap. And I think, as Martin Wolfe said last week, nobody can say with confidence how a monetary system should be structured and what laws and regulations it should have. Given that, and also the tumult going on economically across the world, we should be devoting our energies to fixing the system we have, mending the problems, but keeping what works. And so we in this government have taken significant steps to improve the banking sector, making sure that it fulfils its core purpose of keeping the wheels of the economy well oiled. We are creating a better, safer financial system, with the Financial Policy Committee created in this Parliament focused on macroprudential analysis and action. And as the Honourable Lady opposite pointed out, that FPC is being given counter-cyclical tools to require more capital to be held to increase um, the leverage ratio and the counter-cyclical capital buffers at times where the economy is, is experiencing over-exuberance to push back against that, as the previous Governor of the Bank of England said to remove the punch bowl whilst the party is still in full flow, and that's incredibly important. We're also reducing dependence on debt. Since the financial crisis, the UK banking system has been forced to significantly strengthen its capital and liquidity position and is continuing to do so. But very importantly, and I do want to stress this, just regulation is never going to be enough. In this government, we are really promoting choice, competition and diversity. And I'm delighted that there are 25 new banks talking to the PRA, the Prudential Regulatory Authority, about getting a banking licence. And there are strong efforts from the government to promote the mutual sector, to build and enhance the capacity of credit unions, to better serve the real economy, enabling to the, the boost of funding for small businesses to help families and to improve customers customer service. So we've put in place a number of schemes to help the transmission, the actual transmission of money from banks to customers. Now those include the funding for lending scheme that has lowered the price and increased the availability of credit for SMEs. Um, as the Honourable Lady Opposite pointed out, I believe, we've created the British Business Bank which is helping finance markets work better for small firms, and we're putting a lot of resource and effort into building that to help the businesses in our economy. And we also have a programme of measures to increase competition in the SME lending market, including flagship proposals to open up access to SME credit information that will help challengers to get in on the Act, and having banks pass on declined applications for finance to those same challenger banks. In addition, we now have an appeals process whereby small businesses that have been turned down for funding can get a second chance, and that's actually secured an additional 42 million of lending just since its launch. So these are all measures to try and help access to finance for small businesses. And then to mitigate the very real problem of house price bubbles, we're putting in place supply side reforms to promote home building and home owning, as well as measures to the um, prudential regulatory authorities to enable them to limit the amount of lending that households can take on. So, but I do agree with members of all sides of the House that we should not be content with the system as it stands. We have to be seeking to improve it and to make it function better. And I do think in Mark Carney as our Governor now, we have an excellent central banker who has the experience and knowledge to put the right reforms in place and see them through. And as he has said, reform should stop only when industry and society are content and finance is justifiably proud. So in the medium to long term, we need to create a culture where research and analysis doesn't shy away from going against the orthodoxy. As our honourable members across the House have said, we need to look at other alternatives and we should be having that discussion. It's very healthy to be doing it and that's how you get progress. So Andy Haldane, as a Deputy Governor's call for a broader look at new monetary ideas and other existing monetary ideas is absolutely right. And we do, of course... Yes? Yeah. 
uh, pleased uh, she believes that alternative systems or alternative ways of uh, trying to improve the monetary system should be explored. Uh, will she uh, give support to the idea that there should be a commission which is set up to examine this, all the alternatives? Uh, that was actually recommended um, by the uh, Honourable Member for Richmond Park, I think, um, as well as by me, so there is some cross-party support. Uh, is that not a, a, an idea whose time has come? Um, for, my own, for my own opinion, I actually think that um, a, a, an organisation such as the Treasury Select Committee that my honourable friend is a member of would be entirely the right place to have such a discussion. Of course, we had the Vickers Commission that looked at what had gone wrong and what measures could be put in place, the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards that specifically addressed the issue of incentives and motivations in banking. I'm not somebody who normally would advocate the establishment of great new commissions. I think we already have exactly the right bodies to be able to look further at different orthodoxies and, of course, as Andy Haldane in the Bank of England has said the bank themselves will be looking at and encouraging um, alternative views to be, um, to be explored further. But of course we also need to continue embracing innovation, both in the, if you like, software of how payments are made and also in the hardware of the idea of new currencies such as cryptocurrencies and digital currencies. Both of those can open up competition and give customers greater choice and greater access to funding, but we do have to do so with a degree of caution. In November we published this month, we published a call for information inviting views and evidence on the benefits and also on the risks of digital currencies. So digital currency businesses can continue to set up in the UK and people can expect to use them safely. Now I am the last person who could be described as statist, but I would absolutely accept that we must always be ruthless in our determination to regulate new ideas that come to the forefront because as night follows day, as new ideas come in through shadow banking, through new lending ideas and so on, there will be some people who seek to manipulate new schemes and new currencies for fraudulent purposes. So I'm absolutely alive to that fact and it's very important that the government <coughs> therefore carries out this research. So in conclusion, this government's belief is that the current system, modified and improved with far greater competition, is the one that will serve the economy best. Reform is vital. Again, as Andy Haldane puts it, historically, flexing policy frameworks has often been taken as a sign of regime failure. Quite the opposite ought to be the case. We need banks to lend to young families wanting to buy houses and repay them out of future labour income, rather than relying on the bank of mum and dad, or for businesses wanting to seize opportunities, gain new markets and create jobs and growth. Our existing system offers a forward-looking and dynamic framework in which tomorrow's opportunities are not wholly reliant on yesterday's savings, and it builds on the expertise of banks in assessing risks and making the lending decisions that we badly need. In 25 years myself, in the heart of the financial sector, I saw it at its best and sadly sometimes also at its worst. We are trying to remedy the worst, but Madam Deputy Speaker, let's also keep the best. Thank you. Steve Baker. Madam Deputy Speaker, this uh, debate has been a joy at times. I'm extremely grateful to these honourable and right honourable members who helped me <laughs> secure it. Um, the honourable gentleman for uh, Oldham West and Royton made clear his support for sovereign money. And I, I have to say, I think one of the great uh, advantages of such a system is it would make explicit what currently is hidden, and that's that it is the state that's trying to steer the monetary system. And if such a system failed, it would at least be clear that it was a century planned monetary order which had failed. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman for Clacton talked about the ownership of deposits, and I was glad to support his private member's bill. But it reminded me of the intervention for the, uh, by the Honourable, Honourable Lady for Hackney North, who talked about um, deposit insurance. Of course, one of the problems, as we saw in Cyprus in the context of depositor bail-ins, is that actually your deposits are akin to a share in a risky, inv a risky investment vehicle. And actually, a little bit more clarity about what a deposit means and what risks a depositor is taking uh, might go a very long way. The Honourable Gentleman for Hitchin and Harpenden uh, indicated one of the greatest controversies amongst free marketeers, and that is whether or not fractional reserve deposit ta uh, taking is legitimate. Um, the Honourable Gentleman for Great Grimsby made, uh, mentioned Major Douglas, which I think he saw put a smile on my face. Major Douglas was dismissed as a crank even by uh, Keynes, who in his writing uh, uh, dismissed him as a private. And I think this points to one of the issues here, is that the 
possible range of debate is absolutely enormous. I'd like to leave my very final word, Madam Deputy Speaker, with Richard Cobden, a member for Stockport back at the time when this was a big uh, issue uh, before. He said, I hold all idea of regulating the currency to be an absurdity. The very idea of regulating the currency is an absurdity. The currency should be regulated by the trade and commerce of the world, and I wholeheartedly agree. Order the question is that this House has considered money creation and society. As many as that opinion, say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it.